היי, היי לשבע, היי קלסי. היי, יש פה מלך. חג שמח. Hi to all, Chag Shavuot Sameh for us, for everyone. We are so grateful that uh, we have the opportunity to meet here again. So we hope that all of you are very well. And let's continue. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jali. Okay. Just a sec. So as usual, we start with some breathing meditation. Just trying to let go of any disruptive thoughts. And then in the space in front of you sits the Buddha manifesting in the form of a fully ordained monk. Wearing saffron robes. His right hand making this gesture of touching the earth and his left hand in the, the gesture or the mudra of meditative backward poise holding a begging bowl. And then surrounding the Buddha are the great masters of the past who came after the Buddha, followed his teachings, and attained high realizations or full enlightenment. Nagarjuna, Ayadeva, Dignaga, Dharmakirti, Chandrakirti, and so forth. Also think that the 84 Mahasiddhas, the great 
practitioners of India, they are also in the space before you. All the masters of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. inspiring us and serving us an object of refuge. And we're of course surrounded by all sentient beings. who despite their different physical appearances, different preferences, interests, knowledge, and so forth, are all the same, wanting to be happy, and avoiding suffering. And all having the capacity to free their minds from all suffering and other hindrances. And so focusing on each and every sentient being surrounding us, let's generate affectionate love. A mental factor that is caring, full of affection. And it feels close. So all these beings accepting of their shortcomings and so forth. And that feeling of closeness then gives way to great compassion where you focus on the endless suffering sentient beings experience and generate that deep aspiration and to be free from all their suffering and the causes of suffering. together with the aspiration, may I be able to protect them from any type of suffering and its causes. And that aspiration then becomes the determination to do whatever is necessary, no matter how long it may take, 
to free sentient beings from suffering and its causes. To take personal responsibility for their well-being. And since realistically we can only achieve that once we become enlightened ourselves, so let's then generate bodhicitta, the aspiration to attain the fully enlightened state of the Buddha, of a Buddha. Not just for our own benefit, but mainly for the benefit, benefit of all sentient beings. And think that you will study the remaining verses of Chandakirti's text also with exactly that aspiration. And then without letting go of the mind of enlightenment, let's recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And to be sure you, that you deepen your love and compassion for sentient beings even further. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then directed at the visualization in front of us, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, other great masters. Reverently I prostrate with my body speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings.
Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. All right. So, and just for this coming week, um, well, probably don't have that many classes left if I. Well, I'm able to finish uh, soon, so maybe three, four more classes. Let's see. But um, as to the meditation, we'll continue, of course, with the Mind of Enlightenment. And before we get to emptiness, I mean, bringing together bodhicitta and wisdom understanding emptiness, well, we've got one more week, and you've got a lot of time with that anyway, but let's do one more week. Uh, with the mind of understanding or perceiving the lack of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. So just to remind you again, for this coming week, to again and again generate the mind of enlightenment. And if you participated, if you were, well, this to His Holiness's teachings, uh, well, were there or listened online, then you know that His Holiness's main practice is exactly that, the mind of enlightenment, His Holiness generates it again and again. And so following His Holiness's example, we should do, of course, the same as far as we can. And however fake it may feel, especially in moments when it feels like we can't do it. This is the last thing on my mind to have compassion for sentient beings. Well, definitely in that moment, we should make an extra effort. And His Holiness talked about the benefits of generating such a mind since we instinctively want to be happy, we want to be free from worry, fear, suffering, pain, etc. Well, it makes so much more sense for our own benefit, but also for the benefit of others to over and over generate the mind of enlightenment. So if you find you forget about it or you uh, you're not up to it, you don't want it, generate the mind. Well, just think of the benefits that His Holiness spoke about in great detail last time. And if you weren't there, well, it'd be a good idea to listen to the recordings. I mean, there's no one else who can explain um, these concepts such as, well, the importance of bodhicitta and so forth, like His Holiness. But at the same time, as His Holiness also spoke about the wisdom aspect. Now, His Holiness mentioned emptiness, we're not there yet. Uh, we're focusing before we come to emptiness. So we're bringing the two together, emptiness and bodhicitta. We'll spend another week on alternating between, well, bodhicitta and the wisdom understanding that there's no self-sufficient, substantially existent I. In the sense that it feels to our mind and not at all times. It feels at certain times to our mind as if there were, of course, a separate entity, separate from mind and body that doesn't necessarily exist independent of mind and body, but still something uh, that is findable. That's something that we could actually, if we went through our mind and body, or th went through our five aggregates, we could pinpoint that and we could say, oh, so this is the I that owns mind and body. This is the I that uses, utilizes mind and body. That is the owner, the controller of mind and body. That's how it feels, as if there was that separate entity. And there is a sense I could recognize that even without mind and body. I could, without taking to my mind and body, I could actually take to mind that kind of I. It feels that way. So as if there was a, this self-sufficient, substantially uh, entity, substantially existent entity. An entity which is such that you could theoretically exchange that eye for the eye of another person. So in other words, well, take on the mind and body of another person. Take your own eye 
that controller, that utilizing entity, and you could actually take on the mind and body of another person. So exchange your eye in that sense. Well, exchange your eye not to take on the eye of another person, but uh, to switch places in that you become this other person with this other, well, you, with your own eye, you, you take on the mind and body that is the aggregates of another person. That's how it feels. I mean, just the fact that maybe that wish may arise for some people, not for everyone, uh, or the idea that that is a possibility, um, at least theoretically. So this sense of an eye, well, let's understand, let's uh, spend that coming week um, on reflecting on the fact that this is impossible. It may feel that way in certain situations, so if there was this controller, this separate entity that's not just labeled as a controller, but actually acts as such. Um, and remember that we ourselves don't have such an eye, especially in our interaction with other people when there's very often a very strong sense of a self-sufficient eye. Remember, it doesn't exist. But also uh, with regard to others, others for whose benefit we want to attain the enlightened state of a Buddha. Well, they don't have that type of eye. Such a eye, such a uh, person is impossible. Person, as in like an entity that makes them that being, it's totally impossible. It doesn't make any sense. Cannot be found. Although it may appear that way to our mind, it's just because our mind is so used to to this appearance due to our uh, obstructions obstructions in the mind but let's remind ourselves so time and again we achieve we want to attain the enlightened state of the buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings who lack such a self so i myself lacking such a self i want to become a buddha for the benefit of all these beings their self not existing in the way just explained okay great so that's for next week and then there are a few questions, but I'm not sure I understand these questions correctly. So let me just um, say this. So there's one question, and I'm not going to answer it today because I want you to specify for next time what you actually mean. So Elisheva, she asks, there seems to be a difference between conventional eye and absolute eye. So I want you to explain that absolute eye, if you if you don't mind, for next time. What do you mean with the absolute eye? Do you mean an absolutely existing eye? Do you mean an eye that is an ultimate or al, uh, absolute truth? Um, what do you mean with the absolute eye? And then I'd be happy to um, answer your question. I just don't want to go back and forth now. Um, and anyway, I was thinking some of the questions I can leave um, until the very end, unless they're directly related to what we're going through right now. So I'll definitely answer it, but uh, whether I do it next time or the time after that. But please, uh, Elisheva, please explain to me what do you mean with the absolute I? Okay, and the rest is clear. And then there's another one about dreams. What is the um importance I, I guess you could say the importance the relevance of dreams of course in the in west in the western traditions the different disciplines like psychology and so forth well uh they're sometimes considered important um, a good way to i guess digest our experiences throughout the day so how is it in buddhism there's a number of questions here um so the reason for the dream, why do we dream? I haven't come across an explanation in the scriptures why we dream. It's just a, it's just as we it's like the same question, why do we sleep? Um, why do we dream? Why do we go through the intermediate state after we die, before we're reborn? Why is there this intermediate state? It just is. It just is the way uh, our mind works. And my personal and i'm not saying there's not a reason but i haven't come across an explanation but my personal reason my personal understanding is our mind gets so exhausted operating on a really coarse level i mean without afflictive emotions it's so coarse 
the stronger our afflictive emotions, the coarser our mind. Whereas when we fall asleep, the mind becomes much subtler. I'm thinking that could be a reason why, especially when in the case of highly, highly realized lamas. I mean, as long as the Dalai Lama talks about sleeping for eight hours every night, I just don't believe that. I think as Holiness teaches for our benefit, of course, especially in the 21st century, I mean, people really don't sleep enough and face all sorts of, um, well, physical and mental illnesses because of not sleeping enough, well, problems or even illnesses. So this is a time when it needs to be stressed that you get your, I don't know, seven, eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, I think this is why Holiness kind of stresses that especially when people come to the Dharma on top of being so super busy that they usually are in the way they usually are on top of that, then they're trying the impossible to practice and study and do everything and without much sleep. And so that's not the right approach. And I guess well, it could be one reason as homeless talks about the importance of sleep, but I just cannot imagine as homeless uh, sleeps in any way that we would do. I mean, like I'm thinking of Lama Zoparimpachi, uh, from whom we know he doesn't sleep. Um, we can actually be witness to this. I mean, you can't fake it. You can't fake not sleeping and giving a teaching all night long and then continuing the next day with all the teachings. Like, you can't fake it. And so it's it's very obvious that Lama Zoparimpachi doesn't sleep. He may nod off for a few moments, but that's all. That's all Rinpoche needs. So if he needs it at all, and I don't know what he's really doing when he nods, when it seems he's nodding off, he may just be in this, I don't know, meditative expert poise. Um, well, he may be in the meditative expert poise all the time anyway, but just manifesting in that way. We just don't know. But the point being that uh, these great masters, they don't need sleep. It seems because their mind have become so subtle. They're they're not exhausted by their afflictive emotions, such as I don't know, uh, attachment, aversion, envy, greed, etc. And therefore, the mind is much more rested. Our minds get exhausted, especially by afflictive emotions. And we all know when when we do retreat or um, do a lot of practice, then the mind is well. In, in certain situations, not always, but less under the control of afflictive emotions. And so therefore we need less sleep. And just being out in the in the world and doing our thing, of course, it's tiring to do this and that and going from here to there. But there's afflictive emotions. There's our interactions with other people. They are they're there, they're present. We may not be aware of them. We're so focused on the situation in that moment, and that's exhausting. So Therefore, we need to sleep in the first place. And so dreaming uh, is, uh, a, a course, a subtler kind of mind that helps us to digest, I guess, in Buddhism, you'd say the same thing, what has gone through, to go through it again if you've repressed things, etc. Uh, so that's probably the same as in modern psychology. It keeps us healthy. Um, is there a meaning of those dreams? Well, actually, it depends on who's dreaming. I mean, some of the lamas, they talk about dreams. His Holiness has spoken of dreams, whether those are like the same kind of sleep dreams as, like I said, we don't know. Um, usually with a lama, you, more, you speak more of visions, having certain visions, and they are very meaningful depending on the level of the Lama. I mean, they may still be sleeping, of course, and then they have more visions, they have dreams that are very meaningful. Lucid dreaming uh, is definitely a, a practice. Dream yoga is definitely a Buddhist practice. And again, whether it's like a deep state of mind, like or, well, deep in the sense, as as uncontrolled, I should say, as uncontrolled as it, as it is in our case, well, that's to be seen, and definitely not with lucid dreaming or, Dream yoga is definitely not uncontrolled. So I don't know enough about it. You find it in Tantra, but it's not stressed as much. I mean, I don't think I've heard as woman has really given an explanation on dream yoga ever. I mean, mentioning it, yes, but not really give extensive explanation on it. What types of dreams there are? Well, our ordinary ones, many of them are mistaken minds. We believe something to take place when in actuality we're just lying on our bed. But then there's this whole explanation that our mind may actually leave the body and actually travel somewhere. That's also a possibility. But again, uh, I don't know enough about that. And again, I wouldn't know where to look 
were to to read about it, etc. Um, so yeah, whatever Western science talks, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that that is true of it to the most part. Um, and here it says that in Buddhist teachings, the concept of the dream is often used as an illustration of the idea of awakening. Well, no, it's not the dream that is used as the idea of awakening, but it's waking up from the dream in that for an ordinary person, many of our dreams of wrong consciousness is believing our body just lying there, but we believe there's an elephant in the room, etc. which of course is just a, it's not, there, there's no elephant, not even a conventional elephant. In that moment, it just appears to the mind, which is the difference to labeling an object on the basis of actually having an object of labeling, let's say an actual elephant, versus it just being the appearance to the, to the mind, but then they're not being, uh, of course, everything is an appearance to the mind in that sense, but we still talk of an external world. And there's a difference between uh, an actual external world appearing that may also appear to other minds versus us in our dream. So then it's just a wrong consciousness when we dream of something that actually doesn't happen. And in that case, therefore, we can say it's a wrong consciousness and awakening from it, waking up from it, I should say, is taken as uh, an example for um, for enlightenment, for liberation, waking up from the sleep of ignorance, from the wrong perceptions we have due to ignorance. So this is how it's used. And it's not said to be of great significance if you're just an ordinary person. I mean, like you may remember when His Holiness gives an initiation um, with the pre preliminary or preparatory kind of part being on the first day and then the remaining initiation or empowerment taking place on the next day you're asked to analyze your dreams you're given some kusha grass and then you're asked to analyze your dreams and oftentimes when there's enough time as his homeless talks about the dreams the next day um i don't think his homeless talked about it during the last no he didn't but anyway oftentimes when there's more time so this may mention it and say well these are auspicious dreams you may have had suspicious dreams etc however um it's also stressing well they're just dreams after all so don't get too uh get too obsessive about dreams in the end they're just that appearances to the mind that usually have no no um basis in reality and i mean except for the fact of course we go through things they just go over them again and may digest them and that's helpful kind of mentally digest them all right that's it so we'll answer the other questions it takes too long and let's return to the text um so we got to verse let me just um, I think it was 22 or 23. Um, where is it? Yes. Oh, yes. 20. Oh, 19, actually. Sorry. Well, we may be, we may have mentioned them, but these verses here, actually verse 19 up to 22, um, with these verses, the Buddha is, the, sorry, Chandrakirti is really just talking about the ability of the Buddha to manifest anything. So it talks about a single pore in a single instant. So it doesn't take any time, verse 19. And with a single con cause, causally concordant body. So a body that manifests, so a physical form that is causally concordant that is that is in a in, in concordance that it's, doesn't stand in any contradiction with the dharmakaya and the sambhogakaya of a buddha we've heard last time the actual manifestation the actual buddha it's considered to be the sambhogakaya but that's only visible that's only we can only 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 someone who's a bodhisattva on the 10th ground can see such a being you must have a very subtle mind to be able to perceive um, a Buddha in the form of the Sambhogakaya and the Dharmakaya of course are really the mental qualities of a Buddha the mind of the Buddha the cessation in the mind of a Dharma. so only a Buddha can perceive those directly uh, therefore we need these emanations the Sambhogakaya for us ordinary beings the Dharmakaya for us ordinary beings not accessible 
but of course how does the buddha benefit us benefit us through teaching so teaching not just through the buddha's words but through the buddha's actions and the actions well how are they manifested well you need a body to perform at least a physical action that is visible to others or others can perceive not just visible but can be perceived in other ways through the senses and those are the emanations so this is what this is talking about it displays all these different emanations so these verses from 19 to 22 he says well the previous birth the previous existences of the buddha they're all shown i mean they're in the show like you you meet this person in other words it's actually just an emanation uh, an emanation of a buddha so let's say it's homeless the Dalai Lama is an emanation of a buddha buddha shakyamuni was an emanation of a buddha so buddha shakyamuni is just just an emanation i mean just not in any way uh not merely i wouldn't use the word merely as not uh, as, as being kind of inferior almost in that way no but saying that uh yeah it's not the sambhoka kaya because we wouldn't have been able to even hear the words of buddha shakyamuni or get the teachings of buddha shakyamuni if it wasn't for that emanation and that is displayed so um why the previous birth because we need it's endless different emanations by the way so we need these examples like of course the buddha mainly teaches how to become enlightened and so the previous lives how the buddha has gone through uh practice so we can learn on the basis of that example so previous birth that have no longer they're now ceased so they're no longer there but very clear they're very clear and without error uh they manifest so all these past occurrences all these past events they appear clearly vividly without error so without error really means without exaggerating them but uh, in the way in which they actually took place so all these lives are displayed by the buddha in that vividness that's what verse 19 tells us and then the sage the buddha himself so sometimes described as this the sage who took birth in certain buddha fields in these pure realms so not just on earth but also sometimes in certain pure realms um and again kind of displaying those four sentient beings so that they can actually perceive them um in whichever way um that manifests uh well as an appearance to sentient beings so the bodies the deeds the different strength and powers that a, a buddha had at that time when still practicing um the the different types of disciples buddha had uh whatever whatever uh physical forms the buddha took on so in the form of course as a bodhisattva so manifesting as bodhisattvas kind of manifesting past events um making them accessible to to living beings um likewise whatsoever teachings they gave what what were the teachings that they gave so we're going through those the ways of life they assumed um whether they what kind of class of society they belong to if it was life on earth i mean right now we can only imagine life on earth it's really hard for us to think that someone could exist in other forms but let's be open-minded let's be open to this because this is a huge part of what the buddha tells us and if the buddha was so right about the four noble truths about the afflictive emotions that cause all our suffering if we have some understanding of that why should he lie about uh, everything else so to be at least open-minded anyway so all these what the buddha what kind of dharma the buddha uh, taught who listened to the dharma what activities what kind of um uh, deeds what are kind of bodhisattva deeds the buddha went through um the length and the quantities of offerings the made the buddha made like making offerings also an important part like generosity making offerings um all this without omitting anything the buddha displays within a single body okay so that's what verse 21 tells us and likewise his discipline he displays uh this discipline his his well ethical discipline so that was generosity in the previous verse but also the other perfections such as uh ethical discipline um forbearance or patience diligence meditative absorption and wisdom 
So whatever practice is there for the Buddha engaged in in the past without omitting anything and in clearest detail, all of this he displays within a single pore. Now, when you hear about this, okay, displaying all these different emanations, okay, but why a single pore? Where does that come from? A pore in his skin of which we've got thousands. A Buddha has thousands. Well, I mean, again, it kind of seems like, well, a Buddha has pores. But I think what it really means is, um, of course, and actually um, Jimmy asked a question about that. So hopefully, uh, even without going through the question, there's the question itself, but uh, I seem to remember um, the question has to do with how does the Buddha emanate? How, do, how does this emanation take place? And in the sutric system, actually, the explanation is, well, there's no real explanation, I guess. I mean, there is to a certain degree, but the fullest, the most complete explanation you find in the tantric texts. So how does the Buddha emanate? Wait, our body, is that an emanation of our mind? No. Our mind takes on a body so it's a different a different uh, approach it's a different way of um, obtaining a body so our body which just connects to well in the case of a human body connects to the fertilized egg of our mother um, our yeah our future mother or our mother and so it's not that this is an emanation this 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 fertilized egg is an emanation of our mind, not a tool. No, but in the Buddha, in the case of a Buddha, um, the physical body, of course, the mind is also the cause of the physical body, but we distinguish between a substantial cause and a cooperative condition. So the substantial cause, as you as you know, is like a seed that gives rise to a flower. So the substance of the seed transforming into the substance of the flower. But of course, with the help of a of cooperative condition such as uh, the, the sun, the warmth of the sun, possibly um, a farmer planting the seed and so forth. Those are the cooperative conditions. So the substantial cause of the, of the emanations of a Buddha are the subtle energy winds in the body, which that explanation is really given in Tantra, not, not in the Tantric texts, not in the Sutric texts. And then in, in that context, it makes sense. So the mind of the Buddha, of course, is a cooperative condition. Without the mind of a Buddha, you wouldn't, you, the Buddha wouldn't be able to manifest from that subtle energy, wouldn't be able to manifest an emanation. And it's not just one emanation, it's so many of them. And that is, again, it's, it's impossible for us to understand. We can't even control our, our single body. And we can't control that. We can't control our mind. We can't control our body. And so it seems like how can you control all these different emanations that are, um, well, like a, their body, they're considered a body. Um, they're considered to be a body, but um, not just one, but so many of them. So you, the Buddha is able to manifest exactly what's necessary spontaneously in that moment through the pore of one body so it's kind of saying you've got so many pores so coming from these endless pores in the body so there's so many of them it's not literally saying it's got an ordinary body with ordinary pores and so forth and each pore uh, can then manifest a few beings it's not literally like that i don't think it's like an ordinary pore as such it's just uh if it comes from well, the Sambhogakaya, of course, the Sambhogakaya itself also having arisen from the subtle energy of the, that, that well, that is, accompanies the mind of the Buddha, the clear light mind of the Buddha, which is really the, the mental consciousness of the Buddha. There's no coarser type of mind, as in our case, we have a clear light mind, but it's hardly ever active. So the Buddha's mind is really that continuum of a clear light mind from the time when the Buddha was a Bodhisattva. And now that clear light mind is fully active, free from all obscurations. And with the subtle wind, which is responsible for the different emanations, so the Sambhogakaya, from which then the different other emanations. So when you say, when it says here, from the different pores of the Buddha's body, it means the Sambhogakaya. So from any place in the body, the Buddha manifests further um, bodies, further well, emanations, not just bodies, but whole beings, were all 
you can say controlled by the same mind so again it's like mind-boggling it goes totally beyond our capacity to really understand and all i can say is well ask you to be open about it and allow that possibility and the more you think about it the more it makes sense i mean if we i think in the 21st century really to a certain degree it's easier i mean just as ordinary beings as ordinary human beings well humankind has accomplished it's amazing i mean in terms of the field of medicine and technology and science in general and so forth so the human mind has accomplished so much and we are part of the human family of course we may not have have technically i don't know founded something totally new or new program or whatever new computer program etc but still we are contributing to that so if ordinary beings can achieve everything that at least uh humankind has achieved of course seeing it from the point of view of positive the, the positive achievements um well then a buddha whose mind is totally free from any limitation kind of is is easier to understand maybe i mean it's it's not as impossible as uh as it may seem on first hearing about it anyway so the buddha therefore displays in terms of the space so here just one pore of the body can display all that and of course for the benefit of sentient beings so that's verse 22 to verse 22 and then verse um 23 to 25 uh, so previously, these previous verses were more about the space where it happens. So in terms of the the the, the locality, if you like, in the poor of in in the single poor of Sambhogakaya. Now it's from the point of view of time. So here again, the Buddha shows how the Buddha's. Oh no, sorry. Oh, I'm wrong. This is wrong. This comes later. Uh, what is it? No, it's still time. No, no, it's right. Anyway, I'm kind of getting confused. No, it's, it's it, this is not right. It comes a little later. So anyway, in terms of space, that's still correct. Uh, but it's in terms of the past. It's in the in, in terms of the the past. I mean, no, his own past, his own past practice that is emanated for whoever who, for whoever this is beneficial. In particular, of course, we we need to remember that the Buddha, of course, had teaches or is most effective in his teaching with regard to those beings he has karmic connections to so this is an important aspect although the buddha's qualities are all the same um then the omniscient mind of a buddha and so forth however with regard to the karmic connection that they have to certain sentient beings which goes back even though there's no longer karma but there's karma from the side of sentient beings and it's because of that that they can benefit some beings more than others because of that karmic connection. Okay, but anyway, now the next verses, as I said, verse 23 to, what is it, 25. In there, he talks about manifesting not just his own past experiences, but also those of others, of other Buddhas, of other beings. Again, showing how it's done, in other words. So he shows how he, well, he, she, I mean, Anyway, so he shows how the Buddhas of the past and those yet to come in the future, okay, so those yet to come in the future, uh, and those now present, those in the present, throughout the expanse of space. So the, the universe is endlessly big. It's a huge universe we live in with, with trillions of galaxies and so forth and world systems in there. So there are Buddhas in many of these different world system so they teach the dharma in a resounding and clear voice and how they remain in the world to relieve beings from their pain so all this is is shown by a single buddha if it's beneficial to someone that is it's emanated that is manifested if it's beneficial to certain sentient beings and of course only and so, so from the side of the buddha we need to stress this this is happening all the time but you always need two sides. You need something coming from the side of the Buddha, and that's fully there. But you also need sentient beings to be receptive to it. I mean, to perceive it, to have the karma to receive it. And then, of course, allowing that to be effective. So really, the idea is that Buddhas are all around us. 
um, they're like the sun. The sun shines everywhere indiscriminately, but we need to step out of the shadow to receive the, the sun. So from the side of the Buddha, it's all there. From our side, well, that's a different matter. But anyway, in, in accordance with our needs and so forth, all this is displayed. So in short, they display uh, their own activity on top of their own activity. On top of that, they also all the deeds of the Buddhas of the past, present and future. From first embracing the awakening mind. So from first generating uh, so they're aware from first embracing the awakening mind means generating the mind of enlightenment up to the attainment of the essence of enlightenment. So up to en enlightenment, all that is displayed in their own case and in the case of others. In fact, the Buddha is capable of displaying all this within a single pore, single pore, and within a single instant of time. So here it's stressing again both time and in terms of location and time is all possible. So that's, uh, yeah, that's how, how it's explained in verse 20, 23 to 25. Um, okay, so I hope this is clear. Did I forget something? So just as, to play, so just as the Buddha displays all of his own past activities, the Buddha is capable likewise of displaying within a single point of moment of time all the deeds of the Bodhisattvas of the three times. The Arya... Uh, Pratyeka Buddhas and Shravakas and all these, all these other great beings without om omitting anything. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there it is, twenty-five. So without the deeds of Bodhisattvas of all the different times, all of those are displayed. So, however overwhelming or however unlikely that may sound to us at first, but of course, let's remember what we perceive is so limited. I mean, just scientifically, we don't receive, perceive all the radio waves and, I don't know, x-rays and all that. There's so much we don't perceive, so many smells we don't perceive. So no surprise there. But even going beyond that, going beyond that, well, for our mind, there's so little we perceive and we're so limited by our own self-grasping and so forth. Well, it, it kind of makes sense that there are a lot more possibilities and, of course, driven by great love and compassion. Um, then the Buddhas with their with their mind having this incredible ability, well, all this is possible. For who? For our benefit, for the benefit of sentient beings. So for whom For whom do they do this? For us, basically. All right. And then it goes on to say in verse uh, 126, so um, the Buddha is now has total control. So it's, this is stressing the fact that they have total mastery over their intention, although they don't really have intention in the same way as we think of it as like a conceptual mind. But yeah, there's total control. So all this display is happening in a very controlled fashion. So this pure enlightened activity of a Buddha, which is free from all states, from any kind of obscuration, engages as if it was through merely wishing. Of course, there's no wishing as such. So Lama Tsongkhapa says, and I'm reading the commentary as well because that's the easiest um it doesn't require much explanation so I'm going through the commentary um so it, as if through merely wishing so spontaneous in such a way that a buddha is capable of course he's not wishing as such because that means the buddha would have a conceptual mind but it's just this spontaneous like display within the space of a single atom an entire world system stretching to the ends of space itself and when he displays a single atom that pervades the space of countless or the entire world system, there is no expansion. So without the single atom expanding, nor the world contracting. So that's like, how does that work? I mean, that seems to go against any kind of laws of physics. But again, I mean, the, within our own existence, there are certain laws of physics. But who's to say it, it's like that in, in all instances? I mean, for us, we're restricted the way we live in this world there are certain no there's a certain type of gravity and so forth but that is just the karmic force that is responsible for us to experience this but there are so many more possibilities and so that includes also the fact that a buddha can manifest 
a single atom that pervades the space without the atom becoming larger or that world system um, becoming smaller, contracting. Anyway, um, however like unlikely that may seem, just get a sense of the incredible possibilities, why it is worthwhile to become a Buddha. Of course, we may argue, I don't believe that's true. I don't, I mean, I don't believe that's true. Well, this is why it comes towards the end. I mean, it isn't the main part of studying the Dharma, but it should still be mentioned, these qualities, because if only parts of it, we understand parts of it, we're so much more motivated to actually become an enlightened Buddha. And even with his holiness, uh, if you just think of his holiness, we don't, we can't explain it, why his holiness affects us in the way he does. Really, it's like, it's really difficult to put it in words, what it is. If an ordinary person says this, uses the same words, it doesn't affect us. When his holiness comes into a room, when sometimes just mentioning his holiness's name, people's face faces light up. It's just a totally different response to anything his holiness does. It's, it's very interesting if you compare it to other people. So just that shows this incredible power and we cannot scientifically explain it like we just know it is from our own experience if that's how you feel but um if you've been if you've attended enough teachings i'm pretty sure sooner or later uh, it, it this affects you in the same way and if you watch when this homeless gives teachings just now recently well unfortunately the recording in the different languages don't include the parts when this homeless walks to the uh to the I, I think it doesn't i'm not sure but definitely the tibetan version the tibetan version has everything so the tibetan version has from the moment his homeless leaves the residence all the way to the temple and then in the temple when the teachings are over going back and the reaction of people it's not like a movie star it's it's different um there's much it's a different energy no it's this being moved in a certain way so again this is beyond words it's it's scientifically for us with our limited mind very difficult to explain so that being a possibility someone being able to affect us in such a way well then there's so much more so allow therefore this this way and that way allow this to be a possibility anyway it goes on to say free of discurf discursive thought a buddha can display in every single instant until the end of time deeds countless in their diversity right so the number of diverse deeds that a buddha who's totally free from any kind of discurf discursive thought any conceptual mind he can display this until the end of time so it's countless and unmatched by the number of atoms that exist just in jambudvipa so jambudvipa according to the world system that is explained in the abhidharma um, which we don't necessarily have to take on, but Jampudvita is really just an, a word for describing our existence, our existence in this world, in this particular world we live in. So it's just another way of saying that. So here, the first one, the first of those verses, so 26, that is with regard to space, and the last one, 27, is with regard to time. I've previously got it mixed up, all right? So first it says in the single atom, it stresses that again, in verse 26 and then verse 27 it, it talks about the time so in a single instant anything is possible and it goes on forever until the end of time so when it says as long as their uh, space remains as long as sentient beings remain i will too remain well that is the prayer uh the the prayer a prayer uh, at least in its meaning that the bodhisattvas have have uh, made this prayer they've made in order to then be able to until the end of time benefit sentient beings and now the next part are the different powers a buddha has so we've mentioned the 10 powers uh, they were mentioned before but we haven't gone through them in detail now from verse 28 to verse 29 they're just mentioned sorry verse 28 to verse 30 they're just listed Okay, so I'll just read through them. That's why we can go through it quickly. And then an explanation is given of all these different powers. So besides this emanation, I think we mentioned before, or on top of this emanating anything that's possible, there's certain powers that are really important 
and those are um, expounded on here. All right, so um, wait, let me just make sure in terms of time, we're good with time. Um, can't see, oh yeah, we've got 15 more minutes. All right, so we'll just go through the power. So with, rest, with regard to the powers of a Buddha, you've got the power to know what is correct and what is incorrect. So correct and incorrect here, what is in accordance with reality and what isn't? There's likewise the power to know of the of the ripening of karma. So there's a knowledge of how does a karma ripen? Exactly how does it come? Uh, what is exactly the cause of a particular situation? We know roughly, we can understand roughly, oh yeah, so virtue leads to a happy experience. But in every moment, we have no idea what was the exact cause for every experience in every moment. That's something a Buddha knows. The power to know the diverse aspirations of being. So what do people wish for, right? We don't know what people wish for. And here aspirations can mean non-virtuous ones, neutral ones, and virtuous ones. So anything people wish, and we're all driven by our wishes, by our desires. By our, and here aspirations can also include our desires, like exaggerated, uh, well, afflictive desires. But it's still important to know to be able to guide someone. And it can also course include virtuous aspirations the power to know the diverse elements like the different elements the mind body the different faculties and so forth the power uh oh elements sorry no that doesn't include the elements but well to a certain degree it does but more like well it'll be explained anyway the power to know faculties Oh, so the diverse elements really includes the faculty as in like the sense powers, but here the faculties in the sense of which are superior and which are not. So the abilities, the superior or uh, less superior ones, again, very important to guide sentient beings. The power to know all the path, of course. I mean, we these are mental path, of course, consciousnesses, different types of consciousness that lead to the goals of liberation or enlightenment, or both, of course. The power of cognition to know meditative absorptions, liberating factors, concentrations, meditative attainments, and so on. And there's the power to know past existences, to exactly know what existences a Buddha has gone through, what existences other beings have gone through. That's also helpful. The, the emphasis is not so much on past lives, but in order to learn from the past of course it's very helpful it's gone i mean the past is gone but still we can learn from the past and the power to know death and rebirth of living beings so what it lies ahead their death their their rebirth and the power to know the cessation of anything that contaminates the mind these then are the 10 powers of the buddha of a buddha so that has two parts presenting the first five and presenting the next five so the first uh, five. The first one is, of course, um, being able to the power to, to to know what accords with reality. So correct and incorrect here really means what is in accordance with reality and what is not. In particular, with regard to our actions. Okay. So from such and such a cause, certain effects will arise. Okay. So of course, um, this is. This, this this idea, of course, is very much part of our daily life. This is what drives us. If I do this, I'll get that. You know, if I wish for something, I, I strive for something. I'm, I'm trying to accumulate the causes for that. And then we're incomplete often in, in, in our sense of what is really a cause. Uh, it may be incomplete, it may be incorrect, and so forth. But that is so important, whether we talk about the law of cause and effect or not. But well even animals know that i mean animals know if they behave in a certain way that leads to such and such effect i mean i know my mom's cat when she makes a certain no noise she knows that i pay attention to her and she and, and open the door so she can go outside the cat so it can go outside so anyways if you make cat never mind so the point is therefore even animals know certain things so certain causes give rise to certain effects so from such and such cause certain effects will arise so such a cause is the basis of a certain effect. This has been declared by the Buddhas, namely those who know the truth. So the, the Buddhas are those who know the truth. They know this is in accordance with reality. Um, 
But what is contrary to the statement is declared incorrect. Okay, so examples such as, to give an example, certain uh, undesirable effects, undesirable experiences, they arise from virtue. Well, that is not in accordance with reality. Uh, so it's to understand in particular with virtue and non-virtue, of course, we want to be happy. We want to experience uh, happiness, peace of mind. We want our wishes to be fulfilled. Well, we need to understand the actions that give rise to those. So what is in accordance with the reality? If we benefit others, it leads to beneficial results. Uh, and saying the opposite, that harming someone will bring me happiness, well, no, um, that is not in accordance with reality. This is incorrect, and the Buddhas know that. So from such and such a cause, certain effects will arise. It's certainly correct. It can be correct. Uh, that's declared by those who know such truth, but it's contrary to the statement is incorrect. So they know exactly such unobstructed knowledge of limitless facts is described as a power. So knowing exactly, and we so often get it wrong. We so often get it wrong. And anyway, driven by our afflictive emotions, oftentimes believe that somehow our mind cheats us, kind of makes us do things. It's just this other mind, this affliction that's at work and controls our mind to such a degree that we act in a certain way, believing it brings us happiness, but of course it doesn't. And then, of course, the next is the power of knowing ripening karma. So with respect to extremely diverse fruition effects of these karmas any actions any volitional action has a karmic result i mean even any action in general i mean even if it's a reflex has a certain result but it's neutral usually i mean it's not like a virtuous or non-virtuous uh, action but basically anything has a result and in particular here with regard to our volitional volitional actions so the actions that are intended the knowledge that penetrates with unimpeded potency and force. So there's, there's, there's a complete knowledge of that. Each of these varieties of karma, the desired, which is virtuous, and the undesired, which is non-virtuous karma, and even the opposite. So or unmixed karma that is not mixed, right? So virtuous, non-virtuous, desirable and undesired. The opposite, which is like not clearly delineated. It can be a, a mixture it's like we, we perform a virtuous action, but then there is pride or arrogance or, you know, it's like every action is not always that clear cut. Our mind goes from virtue to non-virtue and back to virtue. And so our actions are a reflection of that. Any of our actions are reflected by that. I hope I'm not going through it too fast. I mean, I could give more explanation, but I don't think it's necessary. I, I don't want to interpret too much into it. And it's it's pretty straightforward here. So therefore, virtuous actions, non-virtuous actions, which are just virtuous or just non-virtuous, and they're opposite, being mixed, the mixture of those. Um, then there are contaminated actions, uncontaminated actions. So there, the fact is thing about the exhaustion of contaminated negative karma, those would be uncontaminated actions. The previous ones uh, are contaminated ones. So we just desire the undesired, they're opposite, this refers to contaminated actions being controlled by, well, at least self-grasping. And then their exhausting factor, which is uncontaminated karma that bring about brings about the exhaustion of, uh, well, anything that prevents us from being liberated. And also the extremely diverse fruitional effects of these karmas. So knowing the actions, knowing the results, the knowledge that pervades all objects of knowledge pertaining to volitional actions and their results through all, all three times is described as the power to know the ripening of, of karma. That's verse 32. So that's something, again, very important to know reality as described in the first verse, in particular with what action leads to what results. And now what is exactly each ripening? What is the result of that? Uh, what is the cause of that? And so forth. And then the next is the diverse aspirations of beings. The next verse describes the different, yeah, well, wishes. Like I said, we, we're all driven even on the virtuous scale, like even from the point of view of the, 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 the level of virtue, uh, there is this, there's, there are always wishes there. And the wishes, there's nothing wrong with, uh, oh, I'm, I see you just posted something in the chat. That's good. Um, anyway, so there's nothing wrong with having a wish. A wish is not necessarily 
uh, afflictive desire. So let's be very clear about it. I've spoken about this before, that afflictive emotions are just an extreme version of certain minds that in their non-extreme, in their, in their, in their, what would you call it? Yeah, well, in their non-extreme in the sense, in in on on the level where they accord with reality. All right. So the afflictive emotions are extreme versions of those minds that are in accordance with reality. They've kind of moved away from reality, kind of exaggerating. So to give you the example of like, well, aspiration, aspiring to become enlightened. That is in general, that is not a non-virtuous mind. We can become enlightened. It makes sense for our own benefit, for the benefit of others. So to aspire towards it, that is an accordance with reality. It's not an extreme uh, type of mind or an extreme mental factor. It's actually a mental factor. But then when I understand enlightenment is something totally different from what I think it is, and I associate the enlightenment of a person, like the qualities of a person with the person, I develop desire for that person not to gain the same qualities, but now I want to own the person. I want to be around the person, always be in their physical presence. Well, then that mind that previously just wished to have the same qualities as this Lama, let's say, for instance, that aspiration has now taken on an extreme aspect or an extreme, uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's taken on an extreme aspect. It's, it's become extreme where I'm no longer focused on the qualities of the person, I'm bringing in myself grasping, I'm associating this quality, like the person that has these qualities and this quality, they have become one, inseparable. I'm exaggerating, I'm exaggerating the virtue of that to such a degree that I believe if I just rub shoulders with this person, it will rub off on me, which that that as that quality in the continuum of the lama doesn't have that ability unfortunately the, the, these qualities in the lama i can only develop them myself but just being around the lama they will not kind of fall down on me no way so that would be an exaggerated version of these qualities i want to be around that person i don't want to be and i don't want anyone else to be around that person because it's my lama right so you see how from an aspiration that's in accordance with reality, we exaggerate and want suddenly, and then it becomes a problem. Obviously, it's no longer realistic and we get into trouble and so forth. So here, Buddha knows all this. So the aspirations that are realistic, that are based on uh, reality and those that are exaggerated, that are, emerge in the form of attachment okay so it says in verse 33 yearnings stem from the power of their seats or emerge from factors such as attachment so there's an extreme diversity of such yearnings and aspirations inferior ones intermediate ones and extraordinary ones so inferior of course attachment desire and so forth intermediate well neutral ones and then the extraordinary, those that are, well, like the aspiration to become fully enlightened. And knowing even the aspirations veiled by other factors, obscured by the seats. So, so that's obscuring the seats of such aspiration as referred to above. A knowledge that is pervasive and engages or penetrates all the facts of the three types, times pertaining to aspirations. This is the power to know the diverse aspiration of beings. So, they're veiled by other factors. They're not always obvious, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So a Buddha knows the seeds of these aspirations, the causes of those. Um, that's a knowledge that's pervasive and engaging in that it engages or penetrates all the facts of the three times, the beings of the three times, total knowledge of those. How helpful to know exactly the aspirations of beings. And previously, of course, the ripening of their karma and so forth. Okay, so I'm going through it quickly, as you can as you can tell, because I said it's not really hard to understand. So these qualities, and in verse 34, uh, it tells us about the different elements. So Buddha is skilled in differenti differentiating all the elements. Um, I have stated that the nature of the eye. So the different elements here, as in like the 18 elements the eye faculty so how much can our eyes perceive in other words or the eye sense power how what appears to it i mean of course we don't have the eyes of a of a 
I don't know, of an eagle or the eyes of a snail or whatever. Do, do they have eyes? I guess. Anyway, so we, we have human eyes, but I would know exactly what they can see. And then, of course, you know, the, of course, the differences even among humans. So that's, again, of course, important to totally know a person and teach them accordingly. So it includes the ears up to the mind. There are six objects, the six objects that appear to the mind from shapes to phenomena, the six types of consciousness. So these 18 elements, all these elements, they're all understood. So that constitutes the element. Uh, all consist of the inner emptiness, so they all lack inherent existence. That also constitutes an element. So the knowledge of a fully awakened Buddha is infinite. So that which penetrates all the diverse element is held to be the power to know the diverse elements. Okay. All right. So once again, my apologies for going through it so quickly, but I've talked about it in great detail, many of these ideas before. And of course, this is also not really the main part of this text anyway. So it's usually not discussed in much detail. As you can also tell from the commentary, just gives some explanation of the words and that's it so but to summarize um first of all we learned about of course the different kayas the dharma kaya the mental qualities of a buddha which only a buddha has access to we talked about the physical like the the aspect of the buddha that includes the physical which is described as the samboga kaya it's not just the body but it's the entire person having a certain mind of course but as the entire person again we have no access to that kind of person because it's only accessible to bodhisattvas who realize emptiness directly their mind is subtle enough to perceive such a buddha and therefore a buddha needs to emanate needs to emanate different manifestations in many different ways and we've heard uh, well, based on the tantric explanation, of course, this being possible due to the subtle energy that a mind of a Buddha is connected to. And therefore, if you take the Sambhogakaya as that, the person who emanates, of course, based on the mind and the subtle energy, then if any pore of the body manifests the past experiences of the Buddha, if that's helpful, the experiences of other beings, anything, anything that is helpful, in other words. So this is just an extensive way of saying whatever is most beneficial to sentient beings to lead them towards enlightenment. So in the pore of one body, in one instant, and this goes on forever. So in terms of space, where these take place, with you know an, on the basis of an atom without the atom contracting a whole world system can be shown and so forth so it's just huge shows this enormity the enormity of what is done here and so in terms of time in terms of space so all this is done but of course because there's certain powers of perception those are of course most important so the dharmakaya which we can't perceive but from that incredible mind of the Buddha comes the knowledge, first of all, of course, what occurs with reality in terms of causes, which causes lead to which result, and which causes do not lead to certain results. So that knowledge is there. There's knowledge, of course, of the ripening of each individual karma. What will be its result from the point of view of the, the result of that karma? And what is its cause? What was its cause? All that is known. So if you think of the endless karmas we have accumulated, the karmic residues we still hold in our mind, all that is known by a Buddha, right? Incredible, knows really more about ourselves than anyone who's not, of course, enlightened. Um, so, and then uh, knowledge of the aspirations of living beings, uh, anything that they desire and knowledge of the elements. So this is how far we got, right? Is there knowing the ripening of karma, the diverse aspiration? Oh yeah, and then we do the next one next week, which is the knowing those of superior and faculty. So in terms of their understanding, their spiritual level, knowing that. Okay, so once again, I, 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 was, I sped through it. I was, it was really quick. But like I like I said, I don't believe it's necessary to go through it slowly. So we've got 20 verses left. So the, we may be able to go through another 10 next time, then 10 the week after that. And if there's still questions, we could make time for that. But I can 
I can see the end is near, so it's not going to be that much longer that we can actually complete this text. Okay, great. Now, let's do some meditation. Really internalize what we've just learned. Open our mind to these possibilities. Of course, in our case, to enhance our aspiration to become just like that, to utilize our mind in that way to actualize our fullest potential. Um, but before we start, let's do some breathing, some breathing meditation, of course, to concentrate our mind, to let go of any mental disturbance, any disruptive thoughts. So, having learned about the amazing qualities described here, well, let's now apply this to ourselves. That we ourselves have the capacity, have the potential to attain these amazing qualities. The benefit of all sentient beings. So once we've attained the Dharmakaya and the Sambhoga Kaya of a Buddha, that is the mental quality as well as manifestation of a Buddha whose body can only be perceived by Arya Bodhisattvas. We now want to reach as many sentient beings as possible. in order to guide them to the state of Buddhahood. So with the help of our mind and subtle energy, subtle wind, we can manifest endless different manifestations of 
our past in the form of practicing bodhisattvas as an example to other beings. And we can manifest other beings, their practice, their progress. On every pore in our body. Limitless emanations, wherever needed, wherever help, helpful. Helping again, limitless beings, especially those we're commonly connected to. To attain the same state that we've reached. Not just that. Not just can we do so without any limit in terms of space or time. We'll also have these mental powers summarized in the ten powers of the Buddha. Which are necessary to lead sentient beings in the most effective and fastest way towards enlightenment. First, there's the power to know what is correct or incorrect in the sense of knowing realistically which causes give rise to which results and which causes could never give rise to certain results. In particular, when it comes to virtuous actions and desirable experiences. Versus harmful actions. And they're, un they're resulting undesirable experiences.
And not just that, we also know exactly which karmic action is responsible for certain experiences, for certain situations that living beings go through. And we know what the results will be of any action of body, speech, or mind. So in that way, being able to advise others in the most effective way based on that knowledge. We have knowledge of what sentient beings wish for. Whether those are afflicted wishes in the form of afflicted desire, neutral wishes such as wanting what's necessary, for instance, to survive. Or virtuous wishes, such as the aspiration to become enlightened, the benefit of all sentient beings, and so forth. We know exactly what every living being wants and can act accordingly in terms of short-term and long-term fulfillment of at least some of those wishes, depending on the benefit. harm of those wishes. And of course, we know the elements of each individual being, their sense powers, in that way, their capacity of their senses, the objects that appear to their minds, sense and mental consciousness, And those consciousnesses themselves. Five sense consciousnesses and of course, the mental consciousness with all its thoughts, ideas, and so forth. To think for those and all the other powers 
have mentioned here. How meaningful our existence would be. How amazingly beneficial. and how effective in benefiting others. All these abilities we've got, once we've eliminated, that was just not in the nature of our mind. namely the obscurations to liberation and enlightenment. And now to conclude our short analysis or reflection, take whichever insight, whatever conclusion you've come to, and single-pointedly focus on that for a few moments. To allow for it to sink deeper into your mind. And then let's dedicate, of course, whatever virtue we've accumulated together. May this become a cause for us to free our mind from all obscurations so that we ourselves will attain those same qualities we just reflected on. In order to be able to benefit all sentient beings in the most effective way. And may this virtue, this positive potential we accumulated also become a cause for our lamas to have a long and healthy life. Of course, his homeless, the Dalai Lama, and all other great masters. May this strengthen and lengthen their lives so that they continue to guide us. And of course, may our Virtue or positive potential have a powerful impact on the beings around us. May help those who are sick, like Tali Lubin, Geshe, Kunsok, and everyone else to quickly recover from their illness, from their sickness. May help those who have mental problems to quickly recover and find inner peace. It may, of course, bring more peace and happiness to all sentient beings. In particular, as described in Shantideva's dedication. 
So let's make an extra effort to really reflect on those words and dedicate accordingly. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. Most importantly, for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, thank you very much. So don't forget, there's no self-sufficient, substantially existent I, the way we went through in the beginning. No I exists that way. No other being exists that way. And of course, at the same time, let's focus on I, wanting, wishing, striving to become fully enlightened for the ben benefit of all sentient beings. Again, of course, who don't exist in a self-sufficient, substantially existent way. So let's make this week again as guided by His Holiness, He's talked about this, talks about this all the time, bring the two together, method and wisdom. And then we'll meet again, we'll meet again next Sunday. Yes, next, next Sunday. All right. So have a great week and uh, see you later. See you next week. Good night, Geshima. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Laila Tov, good night. No, bye bye. Schön, good night. Bye, Geshela. Thank you. Thank you, Dharma friend.